God is up to something bigger. And He wants us to be a part of it. God is up to something bigger and He wants us to be a part of it. That, when I read Scripture, when I read the stories of Scripture, when I read the lives of people who are portrayed in Scripture, that seems to be just the, the constant theme. God's up to something bigger. They're, they were living the little stories of their lives, the things that were interested to them, and yet God comes along and says, actually, I'm up to something bigger, and I want your little story to be a part of my big story. And it's kind of this classic faith struggle. Because we're constantly trying to figure out how we can get God more involved in our little story. And I think much of the time God is trying to figure out, persuade us to live as if our little story is part of a bigger story. Because God's up to something bigger and He wants us to be a part of it. And you see this all through the pages of Scripture. Think of the story of David. David, the youngest brother out tending sheep, comes back from work one day to, be, to find out he's anointed the next king of Israel. God just burst into his life. Your, your little story, I'm up to something bigger, and I want you to be a part of it. Think of the, the children of Israel who lived in Egypt, who were slaves making bricks. And suddenly God just burst on the story and says, I, I'm up to something bigger. And I want you to be a part of it. I mean, it's just over and over through the pages of Scripture. But not just from the stories of the Bible. I don't think I'm, I'm reading into it. I think it's also part of the, the teaching passages of Scripture. So look at this paragraph from Ephesians chapter 1. It's, it's in your notes if you want to read the same translation I'm reading. It's the introduction that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. And all through this introduction is just this idea that says God's up to something much bigger than just the little story of our lives. So he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Did you catch that? Before there was a world, He already chose you and said, I'm up to something bigger, making you holy and blameless before me. Before you went to school, before you went to college, before you chose a career, before you got a job, before you had a family, before you got a home, before you got car notes, before all that stuff happened, I'm up to something bigger, that you would be holy and blameless before me. Verse 5, and let he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Before you even born, he was purposing to adopt you as his child, to be a child of God. He was up to something bigger. Verse 6, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things in heaven. On earth. Here we have the divine eternal will of God, which is he's working to something bigger to unite everything under the headship of Christ. That's his divine eternal plan. But look at verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Here he's saying God, is, God works everything into his bigger plan, everything into his bigger purpose. His divine, eternal plan is to bring everything under the headship of Christ, but he's also at work in our lives, working everything out according to that bigger purpose. God's up to something bigger, and we get to be a part of it. Verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Even the promised Holy Spirit is a promise of the fact that God is up to something bigger. God's given you His Holy Spirit because He's saying there's something bigger that I'm working here. The divine eternal plan where everything's brought in the headship of Christ and the Holy Spirit is the promise and the seal of that. God is up to something bigger and he wants us to be a part of it. So I want you to think today with me of this, this idea. So there's the divine, eternal plan of God, where God is going to bring everything under the headship of Christ. We think of the second coming of Christ, the kingdom of God, heaven, the divine, eternal plan of God. So that there's this thing that God's working on. Then there is 
the immediate story of our lives. This is where we live. This is where you go to work in the morning. This is where your family is. This is where your bills are. This is your immediate story right here. And then there is this idea that God's working on something bigger. God's working on something that's bigger than your life that is going to be a part of the divine eternal plan of God. God is up to something bigger, and He wants you to be a part of it. One of the great stories in Scripture that I think illustrates this is the story of Joseph. If you're familiar with the story of Joseph, it's a long story. It's in Genesis 37 through 50, so we're not going to read all of that section today. But the, the story of Joseph is so cool because it begins with God coming to Joseph and saying, I'm up to something bigger, and you get to be a part of it. And at the end of his life, he makes this great faith statement that basically says, hey, God was up to something bigger, and I wanted to be a part of it. And from beginning to the end, just this incredible story. So I know many of you are familiar with the story of Joseph. Some of you may not have heard it. So let me just hit the highlights today just to kind of illustrate this point. So Joseph is a 17-year-old, the youngest child uh, with a whole bunch of older brothers. And he gets a dream. He gets a dream that one day his older brothers and his father are all going to bow down and serve him. In other words, God comes to Joseph and says, I'm up to something bigger. And you're going to get to be a part of it. Well, Joseph shares his dream with his brothers, who were really excited about that. So they uh, decided they wanted to kill him. But instead of said, that's not good, so we'll just sell him into slavery. I guess that's a step better than killing him. But, so they sell him into slavery. He ends up as a slave in Egypt to Potiphar. Potiphar is like a general in the king's army uh, in our language. And so he, he becomes a household slave. But God always blessed Joseph. Wherever he goes, he's blessed. And whatever Joseph touched, was blessed. So he's a slave in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's house just begins to prosper because Joseph's there, so pretty soon Potiphar just turns the whole, over house, whole house over to him. You just run it all because everything you touch just goes great. And things are going great until Potiphar's wife tries to seduce uh, Joseph, and Joseph resists, and so she gets angry, and she claims rape, and so Potiphar has Joseph thrown into prison. But wherever Joseph goes, God blesses him, and everything he touches is blessed as well. So even in prison, everything's going well in prison. So the warden of the prison says, hey, I'm going to turn everything within the prison under your care. You can run this show, because whatever you touch goes great. And so Joseph is faithful in prison. And while he's in prison, two of the king of Egypt's advisors get thrown into prison, because the king was mad at him. And they both have dreams. And one of the gifts that God had given to Joseph was the ability to interpret dreams. So he interprets the dreams of these two guys. One, it's good news, you're going to be restored. Other, it's bad news, you're going to be executed. But they both come true. He says to the guy who's restored to his position, hey, when you get out of here, remember me, hook me up, right? Which doesn't happen. He gets forgotten. And he languishes there in prison for a couple more years until the king of Egypt has dreams. Uh, and the king of Egypt has a dream, and it's very disturbing, and no one can interpret it. And so he gets so upset, he's ready to kill all of his advisors because no one can tell him what the dream means. And suddenly the one advisor says, hey, I know a guy. Uh, and so they bring Joseph up, interprets the king's dreams, uh, and Joseph says what the dream means is there's going to be seven years of famine, and you have an opportunity to prepare for the famine, and the king says, well, why don't you take charge of preparing the nation for the famine? And so Joseph now is second in charge of Egypt. I mean, it's this incredible story, rags to riches to rags to riches to riches kind of story. Well, the famine spreads not only in Egypt, but across the land of Canaan where Joseph's brothers and his family live. And so they come to Egypt to buy food, and Joseph's in charge of selling food. And it, the, I won't go through all the story, but, but eventually he reveals himself to his brothers. Uh, he he re brings his brothers and all of his family to Egypt. They live in the best part of Egypt, uh, and things are going great. And then Daddy dies. And the brothers wake up and say, you know, maybe Joseph's been cool all these years because Daddy's alive, but now that Daddy's dead, He's probably going to exact his revenge. And so they come to him, and they basically say, hey, uh, before Dad left, he said, you should be nice to us. <laughs> and they make up this story. But Joseph has this great statement at the end of his life. He says to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? For you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Hear what he's saying to them? Hey guys, God was up to something bigger. 
I know you meant it for evil, but God was even bigger than that. And what he was up to was to save many lives. And so I'm going to join him in what he's doing. I'm going to save many lives. I will provide for you and for your little ones. God's up to something bigger, and I want to be a part of what he's up to. I just see this consistently in the stories of Scripture over and over and over. This idea of God coming to people who are living their little lives and God saying to them, I'm up to something bigger and I want you to be a part of it. And it's cool just to read these Bible stories. And so you would think that all of us here today who read the Bible and know the Bible and we know the stories of David and Daniel and Samuel and and, Joseph and Moses and we know all of these stories and we see that you think all of us would be living faithful courageous wonderful lives believing that God is up to something bigger and he wants us to be a part right why is it hard to live with this conviction why is it hard to live like this well I don't know why it's a challenge for you to live like this. I mean, this idea, God's up to something bigger and he wants us to be a part of it, should really supercharge us and get us excited about how we live our lives. But the reality is, for me, it's hard to live like this. It's hard to believe this. It's hard to walk in faith like this. And I just put some reasons in your bulletin and see if any of these sound familiar to you. It's hard for me to live like this, to believe that God's up to something bigger and he wants me to be a part of it. It's hard for me to live like that because God doesn't seem real interested in giving us little people details. God doesn't like to give details. And sometimes we read the stories of Scripture and we think, well, they were lucky. I mean, Joseph's lucky. God gives Joseph a dream, two dreams. But if you go back and read the dreams, there's not really any details there. I mean, all all God really said to Joseph is the same thing that he said to you and me. Hey, I'm up to something bigger here, and I want you to be a part of it. That was it. God doesn't give details. I mean, think about it. If, If God were to give you some more details, wouldn't it be easier to trust that God is up to something and wants you to be a part of it? If God came to you and said, look, you're going to get a phone call on Friday, and it's going to be your doctor, and he's going to say to you that they found cancer, and it's terminal, and there's nothing going to do about it, uh, and you don't have much time left. That's the bad news. But, you know that grandson that you've been praying for for the last five years? You know that grandson who is just running as far away and as fast from God as he can go? You've always held a special place in his, his heart. You didn't know that, but you did. And he's going to find that, he's going to hear the news that you're dying of cancer, and it's really going to rock his world. It's going to shake him to his whole foundations, and he's going to come to you. And in the hospital, you're going to have the opportunity not only to share the gospel to your grandson, not only are you going to lead him to faith in Christ, you're going to have the opportunity to disciple your grandson for the last few months of your life. And after that, after you pass away, I'm going to call him to be a missionary. I'm going to send him to an unreached people groups. And hundreds, probably thousands of people will come to faith in Christ because you have cancer. Now, if God laid all that out, you might could get a little excited. You, you, your Friday morning would come along and you'd say, all right, today's the day it starts. I'm going to get a phone call. And the, mo- the plan's going to be a mo- You'd be at the bookstore going, how am I going to disciple my grandson? You'd be looking at curriculum. What's the best way to do that? You could get excited about that. The problem is, it just doesn't happen that way. At best, what you get is God whispering to you, hey, I'm up to something. Trust me. It's hard to live like this because God doesn't give details. I mean, we we read the story of Joseph, and we're from outside, and we see the whole story, and so we see him thrown in prison because he was faithful not to give in to the temptation from Potiphar's wife, and we as the reader can look at that and say, don't worry, Joseph, it's going to work out. But when you're the one in prison, it's a little bit harder to say, don't worry, Joseph, it's all going to work out. It's hard to live like this because we have to walk with faith. Faith essentially is believing in what we cannot see but we know to be true. 
Believing that God works everything in accordance with the counsel of His will. Believing that God is up to something bigger with this moment in my story and to walk in faith. And that's hard. It's hard for me. Another reason why it's hard for me to, to live like this, to, to live with the conviction and believing that God is up to something bigger and He wants us to be a part of it, is because it's hard to be, we have to be faithful in the small things. We have to be faithful in the small things. When you read the Joseph story, one of the things that I'm struck with is that Joseph was always faithful with whatever God had put before him at the moment. So he, when he was in Potiphar's house, he was faithful as the manager of Potiphar's house. He didn't embezzle, he didn't cheat, uh, he had the opportunity to have an affair with Potiphar's wife, and who would have blamed him, and he, it wasn't his control. I mean, he, he could have reasoned all through that, yet he was faithful. When he went to prison, he could have just languished in, in misery and despair and just did nothing, but he was faithful there to be in charge of the prison and to run the prison in a way that went well for the prison. I mean, every time God put, God put something in his hand, he was faithful with what was before his hand. The struggle for me is, is realizing that the small details of my life are important. And that God is going to use them as part of his bigger story. And that's difficult to believe because sometimes it's just hard to see the connection between this little story and what something that God might be doing bigger. Perhaps God is preparing us for something in the bigger story, so that's why he has us in a position. Or somehow, or maybe God is actually going to use the details of your small story in the bigger story. If you're familiar with the story of Esther and Mordecai, and read the story of Esther, it's a great short story in the Old Testament. It just reads like a novel. You can sit down and read it in one day. And it's amazing in that story how God uses little bitty details that seemed insignificant at the time, but they were part of God's bigger story that was happening. Uh, and it's hard for us to see that. The reality is there are many people who want to be used by God to do something big, but they don't want to be prepared by God to do something big, and they don't want to be faithful with the small things so that God can do something big. It's difficult to live like Joseph because it's hard to be faithful with the small things when we can't make the connection in our mind between the small thing and the bigger thing that God might be doing. It's hard for me to live like this it's hard for me to live with the conviction that God's up to something bigger and he wants me to be a part of it because I know by reading the story of scriptures what that means. I know that if, when God says in your life, I'm up to something bigger and I want you to be a part of it, I know what that means. What that means is you're going to go through trials. What that means is life's going to get tough. What that means is there's going to be some suffering, there's going to be some affliction, there's going to be some persecution, there's going to be some difficulty in life. Think about every biblical character's story that you know, that you love their story, from Joseph to David to Daniel to Paul, uh, all the way through. They all experienced suffering and trials in their life. Every single one of them. Going back to the story of David. David's a little, little teenager. Someone shows up at his doorstep and says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. That's great, except there's a current king of Israel. He's not really excited about that. And Saul puts a price on David's head and begins to chase David around trying to kill him. And, and David's hiding in cave after cave after cave. And you know he had to be sitting there in cave after cave after cave going, what is going on? God, you said you were up to something bigger. Why am I running for my life here? Where's the plan? And there's so many stories like that in Scripture. There's just trial after trial after trial. The reality is, when God calls you out of the stands and says, hey, come join me on the playing field, what you really join is a spiritual battlefield, hand-to-hand -hand combat with the spiritual forces of darkness, and suddenly life gets difficult because you're in the midst of spiritual battle. And many believers at that point just say, you know what, life was so much easier up in the stands. It was just so much easier to live 
with in my little story and not thinking of God's bigger story. It's just easier up there. There's less spiritual conflict. There's less battle. There's less difficulty. I'm just, I just want to tap out. But we know that if we live like God is up to something bigger and we join him in what he's doing, we join this great spiritual battle. And then we'll go through trial. It's hard to live like God is up to something bigger and he's called us to be a part of it. Because the reality is we want to use God's gifts for our little story instead of using God's gifts for his bigger story. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about here. So Joseph goes through all this stuff in his life uh, and he finally gets to be second in command and king of e- second in command in Egypt. He's got all the power, all the position in the world, and here show up his brothers, who sold him into slavery. Now, let's be honest. If that were you, and you now had the power, and you now had the authority, and your brothers who show up, who sold you into slavery, and created the last what 10, 15 years of misery in your life, what would you do? Okay, you're all lying. What you would do is you would exact revenge, right? That's what our sinful nature would cry and say, this is what we should do. And what does Joseph do when he has the power and he has all these gifts of God and he has this position? So when he says to his brothers, hey, you meant it for evil, but God's up to something bigger. And so I'm going to use my power and my position and everything at my hand to join God in his bigger story, not to exact revenge. See, the opposite of of living like Joseph is to live like Samson. You know the story of Samson? Samson's this Old Testament judge, and God gives Samson a gift. He has this incredible strength. And he gives Samson the gift of strength so that he could be a judge to deliver Israel to deliver Israel from bondage to other nations and to bring Israel back to faithfulness in Yahweh worship. That's the bigger story. And God comes to, to Samson and says, hey, I'm up to something bigger here. I'm giving you the gift of strength. And it's not just for you. It's for you to use to bring the entire nation back to faithfulness to me. But Samson took that gift. And if you read the story of Samson's life, he's constantly using that gift for his own story. It's all about his petty fights with with people who've disrespected him or, or people who have insulted him. And he's always using his, his God-given gift, his strength, for his own small little story. And he never th- realizes the reason God has given this to me is to be a part of God's bigger story. And that's what happens is to live like God's up to something bigger and he wants us to be a part of it is to take whatever gifts that God gives to us, and instead of turning them inward, saying, how can I be a part of what God is doing in the bigger story? So, uh, if you were to win the lottery tomorrow, what would you do? What's the typical if I win the lottery story? The typical if I win the lottery story is, I'm going to cash out, quit my job, buy an island and withdraw and not put up with you crazy people anymore, right? That's the typical lottery story. Isn't that? That's within our sinful heart that says, if God gives me a great gift, what am I going to do with it? I'm going to spend it all on me. As opposed to thinking, if I win the lottery and I don't have to go to work anymore to put food on the table or to pay bills, and all of my time is now free, and I have a tremendous bucket of resources. How could I join what God is doing in the world and participate in God's bigger story because I don't have to punch a clock every day? We don't, we don't think like that. We think, how am I going to use these gifts for my little story to milk them for, for me? So part of why I think it's so hard to live like this, that, that God's up to something bigger and he wants us to be a part of it, is that we have to be committed to using whatever gifts God gives to us, not for ourselves, but for the bigger story. Hopefully that makes some sense. So in the month of October, we're going to be looking at uh, this idea. God is up to something bigger, and he wants us to be a part of it through the month of October. Next week, uh, today we kind of looked at that idea in the context of trials and how we experience trials like Joseph. 
Next week, we're going to look at the story of Daniel. Daniel's a guy that comes to Daniel, says, I'm up to something bigger, and you could be a part of it. And then Daniel is plopped into the middle of a pagan culture. A pagan culture. Yet because Daniel believes God's up to something bigger, and he's calling me to be a part of it, it changes how he interacts with that pagan culture. It changes how he lives in that pagan culture. And we're going we're to look at Daniel's life. And then we're going to look also if, if this is true, if God is up to something bigger and he wants us to be a part of it, how does that change how we parent? How, do we, how does that change how we make disciples of the children that God gives to us? Not only is God up to something bigger in our life, God's up to something bigger in their, in their life, and he wants them to be a part of that. So how does that change if we're convicted of that, of how we do parenting? That's going to be our Our at-home Sunday in the fall, we have an at-home emphasis in the spring and in the fall, and this is going to be the one for the fall as we talk about parenting under this, and Aaron's got a luncheon that he's inviting parents to to introduce the faith path to you. That's going to happen on the 22nd. And then the last Sunday of this month, we're going to look at the story of Miriam. Miriam's the sister of Moses. Uh, Miriam certainly knew that God was up to something bigger, and she's got to be a part of that, and And she has this great moment when they cross the Red Sea and she leads them in worship. And and Miriam's doing great, but there's there's this story in Miriam's life when she's so excited about the fact that God is up to something big and she gets to be a part of it. She just has this moment where she comes to the fact that I I don't want my job, I, I want his job. So often we get to these stages, you know, God's up to something bigger and he's called me to be a part of it. Yeah, but I don't want that role, I want that role. And she had to have this experience where she had to wrestle with, can I be at peace with the role that God's given to me as I'm up to something bigger? So we're going to look at the life of Miriam as well. So this morning, let me just ask you some questions. What is your little story? And I don't mean little as a, in a pejorative term. I'm just comparing little to what God's doing bigger in the world. So what is your story? I mean, are you staying at home with a one-year-old child? And that's, that's your story. Are you working an entry-level job in a job that, frankly, you don't enjoy at all? Are you just trying to get through high school? Are you a primary caregiver for a special needs child or for a, a senior adult? Are you an elementary school teacher? Are you an engineer? Are you a college student? What is your small story? What's the little story that you live in? And what would it look like for you Instead of going through life wondering, how can I get God more involved in my little story, what would it look like to change and say, how can my little story be part of God's bigger story? And what would it look like for that transition to shift? So let me give you three words of how you might respond to just this basic truth today in the story of Joseph. The first word is the word believe. Maybe the whole reason you're here today is just to hear this truth for God. Speak it over your life. I'm up to something bigger, and I want you to be a part of it. And I know you can't see evidence of it, but I want you to believe that that's true. Maybe today the whole thing God's called you to do is to simply accept that as truth and to believe it. To walk out of here today with the conviction, God's up to something. Maybe that's The reason you're here today is not the word believe, but the word confess. Maybe today you just, you kind of need to share my heart today and to confess. Yeah, I I believe God's up to something bigger, but God, it's it's so hard to, to trust you when you don't share the details. I just don't see it. I don't understand it. I don't know what you're doing. I, I don't see evidence of it, and I'm struggling to trust you. Perhaps you can confess that today and repent of that and trust. Or maybe you have to confess that, yes, you believe God's up to something bigger, but you're not being faithful with the little things. The little thing that he's given to you, you're not being faithful with that because you don't see how it connects to the bigger story. You don't see how God's going to use this. And so you think it's just something that you can ignore and not really be faithful with. And today you just have to confess to be faithful with whatever God has put in front of you, believing that somehow God is going to use this with the bigger story. Perhaps today what you do is confess because you've just run away from the battlefield.
Because you know when God called you out of the bleachers into the stands, life got tough, life got more difficult, and, and you just cracked under the pressure, and so you ran because you just wanted life to be easy. Maybe today is just a time to confess that and say, I, I don't want to stay in the bleachers, I want to get back in the battlefield. I want to join God in what God is doing. Or maybe it's confessing today because you're just realizing that you're using your gifts. You're using the gifts that God has given to you, the resources, the position, the spiritual gifts. You're using the gifts God has given to you for your small story. And you're not aware that the reason God has given those gifts to you is to be part of his bigger story. And maybe today it's just about confessing that because you see it and repenting of it and saying, God, I want to use the gifts you've given to me for your story, not my story. So maybe the way you respond to this today is through believing just this simple truth. Maybe it's through confessing. Or maybe it's just through worship. If nothing else, to leave church this morning celebrating a God who is up to something bigger. Isn't it awesome that we serve a God who works everything in accordance with the purpose of His will? Isn't it awesome that whatever chaos you're living in and whatever chaos all of us are living in, to realize that God is sovereign over all of that and He is up to something bigger and you and I, little insignificant me, little insignificant you, we get to be a part of what God is doing. And maybe what today and just the story of Joseph will cause you to worship that you, saw, you serve an awesome, sovereign God who is orchestrating something awesome, and you get to be a part of that. So let's come together this month just under this idea. God's up to something bigger, and we get to be a part of it. We get to be a part of it. Would you pray with me?